Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a progressive campaign agency that specializes in community organizing. We work with nonprofit and community based organizations, trade unions, businesses, and social democratic parties across the globe to develop campaign strategies, train engagement staff in leadership and power building, and help you execute your campaign with data driven tactics and actions. And in 2022, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, inspire others, take action, and organize communities for change. To find out how Dunn Street can partner with you, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Socially Democratic is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Morris Blackburn Lawyers have spent more than a century paving the hard path to justice for everyday Australians. They've helped over half a million Australians turn their situation around and know how the system works. Their experience and skills mean that you'll get the best results possible. Find out more on their website, www.morrisblackburn.com.au. Morris Blackburn, experience you can count on. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast, out every Friday, that dives into the progressive campaign issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. You're probably wondering who's this person talking, and sorry, I didn't introduce myself last week. I'm Rebecca, I am the producer of Socially Democratic. I'm usually the one working behind the scenes, but as Stephen has been away, I've had to jump in to do the intros. I promise things will go back to normal next week. This week, Stephen is in the Netherlands, speaking with the chairwoman of the Dutch Labour Party, otherwise known as PBDA, Esther Miriam Sent. Esther chats to Stephen about the PBDA's background, the challenges that they currently face, and also spins a good yarn about how she became a politician herself. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the show, be sure to give us five stars on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. And when you're done listening to today's episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. For updates, follow us on Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And while you're there, I mean, leave us a comment or share the podcast with your friends. We'd absolutely love that. We love engaging with our audience. So that's it from me. Let's get back to today's episode. Okay, we're taking this one on a... Thursday, I do believe the jet lag is still starting to um, only starting to wear off. I uh, will take this one on a Thursday. I'm in uh, the Hague or Den Haag um, in the Netherlands. I'm actually at the uh, the PVDA, the Labour Party's head office uh, here in Den Haag. And uh, joining me uh, on the line, I think from across town, is the president of the PVDA, the Labour Party, Esther Miriam Sent. Welcome to Socially Democratic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, before we sort of talk about, uh, I guess, contemporary uh, uh, Dutch politics and, and, the, and, the, and the PVDA's place within it, I'm interested to hear about your journey to politics. You are the president of uh, this wonderful organisation. Um, but uh, how did you first, uh, like, where did you first get involved in politics or where, was, where did the interest of politics first pick your mind? I think my journey started in diapers with uh, parents and grandparents uh, that were politically active. Um, so uh, in Dutch, we say you, you were spoon fed uh, politics. Um, so I decided to study economics, thinking that that would help in a political career. But at that time, economics was so abstract that I thought, you know, where do these economists get their arrogance and their authority? Uh, so this led to a detour uh, via a PhD at Stanford on uh, the history and philosophy of economics, uh, a return to the Netherlands. And at that point, economics had changed. It had become more policy relevant. Um, so that enabled me to... Um, bring it into politics, which I've done as a senator uh, at first. I joined the Dutch Senate in 2011. I did that for 10 years. Uh, I was also uh, the uh, 
committee uh, chair for the party program for the general elections. Uh, and that was such a fun process with all the members of the party uh, writing a super inspiring program. Uh, so when the job came uh, available to become president of uh, the Labour Party, I decided to make the final switch from academia to politics, although I'm still one day a week a professor of economics. Uh, fantastic. So the um, you obviously were raised into a political uh, household. Um, how did you know that um, when you think back on uh, your childhood, what were the moments that shaped the values that guide who you are today? Um, I think the protests against nuclear energy uh, and nuclear uh, missiles uh, uh, played an important role, made me aware of how you can make a difference if you're really uh, standing up. Um, and in general, you know, my, my parents taught me to take uh, get, get the best out of myself so I could do the best for others. Uh, that's the philosophy in which I was raised. Um, and that is uh, still what is guiding me in my work as president of the Labour Party. The history of the Labour Party, I'm, I'm interested in learning about it. I, I believe it came around in the sort of the amalgamation of a bunch of different parties in the 1940s. The, um, I mean, if you look at the history of the Australian Labour Party or the New Zealand Labour Party or even the British and Irish Labour Parties, they were all founded from the trade union movement, but it seems that there was the, the Labour Party here in the Netherlands was a marriage of a, a group of different movements. To talk me through that. Yeah, so this happened uh, shortly after the Second World War, uh, and the Labour Party is a combination of several left-wing parties, which is interesting because at present we have discussions about merging with the Green Party. And there's now people that are concerned about us not standing up for the Labour uh, view, perspective, uh, but it's helpful to point out to those people that the Labour Party itself what was a merger of several political parties. It played an important role uh, during the Cold War period in uh, developing pension system, healthcare system, education system. Um, and throughout the history, the Labour Party in the Netherlands has been a party that is uh, slightly left of centre, not extremely left of centre, and it has very, very frequently taken on uh, government power, uh, political power, a role in government, uh, sometimes uh, not to the liking of the voters. Uh, so that's the constant uh, negotiation that uh, you have to face in a country uh, such as the Netherlands, where we have a broad uh, perspective of Pro parties. Uh, in fact, at present, uh, we have, I think, 20 parties in parliament, uh, partly because uh, people split off and there were internal discussions. Um, so we always have coalition governments and there's always or there's very frequently uh, disappointment on the part of the uh, voters that you weren't able to you know, uh, get all your program uh, points uh, incorporated or you know, addressed or followed up on. I, that's, I guess that's the challenge for everyone in sort of centrist uh, politics is to you can't please everyone, you can't be everything to everyone. Um, talk to us through some of the uh, the. the the moments, historical moments within the party where it was successful, you, you named a bunch of key signature policies that the party introduced. When, when was the, 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 I guess, the, the glory days of the, of the party in terms of shaping the direction of the country? The glory days started right after World War II, when an entirely new system had to be designed, uh, making sure that there was a social basis for everybody. Um, so that really played an important role. Uh, subsequently, in the 1970s, we had the oil crisis, uh, stagflation, uh, unemployment was skyrocketing. Uh, the Labour Party played an important role in negotiations with with uh, the unions uh, to uh, reduce uh, wage demands such that employment could be uh, improved again. Um, 
the Labour Party played an important role more recently in the aftermath uh, of the credit crisis, when uh, now the budget was seriously uh, in trouble and difficult measures had to be taken to uh, put the budget back on track. Um, and this mo most recent uh, endeavor on the part of the Labour Party, this government that was in place between 2012 and 2017, uh, has hurt the Labour Party a lot. Uh, because the feeling is that the measures that were undertaken were just too rigorous, uh, too much focused on uh, the budget, not social enough. And that's still a, a history that is... Um, is, is hurting us to some extent or is making it more difficult to position ourselves because that's what we try to do we try to on the one hand make sure that there is you know a social minimum for everybody but at the same time uh, make sure that the budget gets spent in a frugal manner and there is no uh, there are no excesses uh, and this mm. tough balancing act uh, no, is, is not always appreciated on the part of voters i would say it's so interesting interesting that you mentioned that it's um I've obviously I've just left the Republic of Ireland and spent some spent 5 days with um our comrades in the Labour Party there. And that was the same experience that they had through 2011 to 2016. They were in a coalition government with uh Fine Gael, which is a sort of centrist right uh government, but all the social policies during that economic crisis in Europe were the Labour Party um ministers. And so they, this austerity measures that were introduced, they heavily impacted the Labour Party ministers. Um, and so, therefore, the feeling amongst the electorate today in Ireland is that they look at the Labour Party as, you're, you're the party that cut all the services that we were so heavily reliant on. And they're grappling with how to come out of that, how to reframe that relationship that they have with their traditional base of voters. I'm interested in getting your thoughts on how the party here in the Netherlands has um, come, how they're trying to restore that trust and confidence in, in the voters following what you guys had, had to go through? Um, I think uh, there are, uh, it's in, on two tracks that uh, these uh, efforts are undertaken. One track is uh, explaining why the choices were made as they were made at that time. Uh, it was a time of crisis, a time in which we had European agreements that we had to stick to. And if we didn't stick to those agreements, then, uh, you know, uh, Europe would uh, uh, get into a worse crisis than it did. Um, uh, it, it was a time when there was concern about future generations and uh, their ability to benefit from the same kinds of uh, you know, welfare state systems that uh, were erected uh, earlier on. Um, so I think uh, what one, one track is explaining the difficult situation uh, we were in, the responsibility that had to be taken uh, and uh, the support for the measures that were undertaken. And the other track, of course, is uh, you know, moving social dem democracy into the 21st century with uh, an offensive program on the challenges that we're facing at present and in the future, uh, the challenges on the inequality in education, inequality in health, inequality in housing, uh, inequality when it comes to future generations. Um, so so it's, it's, it's both, both tracks explaining the choices that were made uh, and also uh, recalibrating uh, our uh, uh, responses and our perspectives when it comes to present challenges and future challenges. And then another thing, of course, that uh, uh, plays an important role is when you have uh, a very appealing uh, leader. Uh, so we, we tend to think, uh, uh, oh, we need to have another program and 10-point steps and let's explain it one more time. Um, uh, but uh, our uh, result in 2019 in the European elections uh, with Frans Timmermans uh, making us the biggest party in the Netherlands uh, for the European elections shows that if you have 
the right flow, if you have a strong leader, uh, then you know, suddenly the tide can turn and uh, can flip in your favor. Yeah, it's interesting. The, um, the Jacinda Ardern experience in New Zealand, I think, really supports your theory there as well. Um, the Labor Party's policies didn't change too much when they replaced their original leader uh, with Jacinda. But then when Jacinda became leader, they became, you know, so much more popular as a party and obviously were elected into the government in 2017. Who were the... Talk to me about the demographics of the type of voter that Labor needs to appeal to. Who did Labor lose... Um, in 2019 that they need to work on to get back? And where do they live? I know the Netherlands is not a very big country, so they're not as big as Australia. Um, and uh, I've been travelling around the last couple of days and it doesn't take long to get from one city to another, which is actually quite good. I'm enjoying that, I must say. Um, but talk to me about the demographics of those people that we the, the party needs to attract back. Yeah. Um, if you look at uh, the people who currently vote uh, for the Labour Party, uh, it's an ageing population. Uh, and that's part of the explanation why uh, votes are getting lost. Um, and uh, that's also part of the uh, explanation for why it's attractive to collaborate with the Green Party. The Green Party is attractive to a younger electorate, uh, has uh, more of uh, a, an image of being concerned about uh, the future, uh, whereas Labour could be seen as somewhat conservative, although I would certainly uh, not agree with that. You know, the, the architect of the Green Deal in Europe is Frans Timmermans, a social democrat, you know, somebody from the Labour Party. Um, so, um, you know, there's an image, uh, image issue, uh, there's an aging electorate, um, and then when it comes to the votes, um, the, because so many cuts were, uh, had an influence on uh, smaller communities, um, there is a rise of populism uh, in some of the more regional areas, in, in some of the smaller communities. Um, and I think there are real uh, opportunities to get those votes back because the Labour Party is about proper basic public services, about public transportation being available and being affordable, uh, about healthcare being in a neighborhood and affordable. Um, so so the, the potential there is for uh, votes, aside from just having a good leader or an appealing leader and a good, uh, uh, you know, good, good plans, is also a focus on uh, the, you know, the, the, the uh, population in, in the more uh, less densely populated areas of the Netherlands. We've experienced in Australia, just like I guess folks have in the United States and Britain, this sort of rise of misinformation in politics and in campaigns, and it's mostly being generated by the far right um, and seeing a rise of these populist far right political movements or parties. Tell me about the, ex the experience in the Netherlands. Have, have you guys experienced such a thing as well? Yes, we have, uh, in fact, now uh, a group of far right populist parties. Uh, it started with the PVV, uh, which is about oh, 15 years old, maybe a little bit, maybe it was, uh, some more. Um, uh, and subsequently, uh, more and more parties are populating uh, the far right. And indeed, in the corona pandemic, uh, there was a lot of misinformation about uh, vaccination, about uh, choices that were being made uh, and presumably not supported. Um, so at, at least a part of the, the populist uh, parties uh, 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 used the corona momentum to uh, generate uh, more voters. Um, so that indeed, there is, and in fact, at some points, there was a, an effort to have a government with one of these populist parties, but that lasted for a very, very short period of time because they're just in it for the counter arguments and are not in it for taking responsibility. Um, but uh, there, there is a lot of misinformation. Uh, in fact, we now have a, a 
a company that uh, is uh, uh, taking up space in public television, uh, that a media company that is spreading misinformation and there's a concern about it. So it's, it's, it's entering mainstream media uh, and with the entering of mainstream media, giving an extra platform to these populist parties. And that is cer certainly a, uh, a cause for concern. Talk to me about the strengths of the Labour Party here in the Netherlands in terms of its ability to get back into government. I'm talking to some of your colleagues here in, at head office. You know, you've got uh, 40,000 or 50,000 members, which is, I think, a huge number, um, a ratio compared to Australia. That's a, a, that's a great uh, resource that's available at your, um, at your disposal. What are some of the structural strengths that the party has that you can use to um, become po politically strong again in, in national politics? Uh, indeed, one of the strengths is that we're, we have the most uh, members, although one of the populist parties is claiming to have more, uh, but uh, there, there's misinformation going on there, because what <laughs> they do is they come to people who join, but they don't subtract to people who leave. Uh, so uh, that leads to uh, you know, only increasing uh, numbers of members, but so we're, we're the largest uh, member party. Um, there uh, are you know, many uh, people that were educated uh, within our uh, you know, scouting and education program. Uh, so there's a network of uh, mayors, there's a network uh, of uh, uh, participation or visibility in city councils. Um, I, I think, what, what do you call them? Uh, the mayor uh, is the government at the local level with, is it aldermen? Some, is that the name you call you? Yeah, or, or councillors, I think is the name used in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we recently had uh, local elections as, uh, at the uh, city level. Um, and uh, out of the big national parties, we did quite well. Uh, but also at the local level, you see the populism uh, development, mostly with uh, local uh, parties. Uh, so uh, local The Hague, local Nijmegen, where I live. Um, so, uh, so, but, but uh, disregarding the populist development at the local level, we did quite well, and uh, we're also occupying quite a few uh, council uh, positions. Uh, in Amsterdam, uh, we uh, were the largest party, uh, and what's uh, what seems really appealing is the wish for a new narrative. Uh, a narrative uh, that is also appealing in Germany, a narrative of dignity, a narrative of respect, uh, a narrative of, uh, you know, if, if you give people their own responsibilities in a liberal perspective, um, you know, you, you disregard all the inequalities they encounter in their lives, uh, inequality in education, health, uh, occupation, um, there's a real uh, wish for a new narrative on meritocracy. Uh, you know, why is it? Uh, and even in the Labour Party, for the longest time, we thought that uh, you know, p uh, getting the best out of people meant that everybody should go to to uh, co uh, university, uh, and we should, and uh, th then you get rewarded with a really high uh, pay. Uh, and there's really, I, I feel that we're at a turning point, at a turning point where we're rethinking. You know, what is it that we really value? What is this, is it that that uh, joins us? Uh, and how can uh, government create the basic conditions to facilitate uh, facilitate this? Um, of course, uh, uh, I'm an optimist. Uh, you have to be as a Labour president, uh, but uh, the, the, the optimism is supported also by election results in countries around us, uh, election results in Scandinavia, in Germany, Portugal, Spain, um, so I, I have a feeling that there is a new 
uh, as we say in, in, in Dutch, you know, there's a new breeze or a new wind or, you know, there's a, a change going on in, uh, you know, what we value and what the government needs to do. Uh, and I, I see great opportunities also supported, of course, by uh, Frans Timmermans and his uh, results in 2019. Um, uh, I, I have uh, good hopes. And part part of what colored the most recent elections that we had is that in the Labour Party, we had a switch of leadership right before the elections, which is not a very good thing to have. And the previous elections were very much about Corona. Uh, and, and Mark Rutte, he's our strong leader. Uh, he guided us through co Corona and uh, we were still in the middle of it, uh, hoping that, you know, rally around the flag, he would uh, yeah. keep doing uh, his good work, uh, as le at least where, where, where Corona is concerned. And I really think that in the next elections, he will most likely uh, step down. Uh, if we can uh, come up with a really strong candidate and with uh, a story that uh, you know, touches on people's emotions uh, and the emotions about dignity and respect and the plans to, uh, to support this, um, I, I have really good, uh, good hopes that we're going to get uh, good results. Um, with your uh, uh, academic economic background um, hat on, um, just considering about where the European economy is going uh, post-Brexit, uh, now that we have this, uh, you know, war on, your, uh, on Europe's eastern flank, um, what implications does that have for the European Union uh, and the European economy? What kind of impact will this have on the, the Dutch economy and how can a social democratic party like the Labour Party um, construct, a, I guess, a, an economic argument to, the, to its citizens um, to, to ensure that, um, you know, that it can continue to, to deliver good public policy in the areas of health and education and job creation and, uh, and the yeah. like. We are in, I feel like we're in this sort of era of uncertainty at this moment. I just want to get a sense of where you think things are heading. Yeah. I think it's important to stress that economic growth is a means and it's not an end. And we often forget uh, this. Uh, and it's a means for well-being for, pe uh, for people at present and in the future, in the Netherlands and elsewhere. That's, that's, I think, the yardstick that we need to use when we consider public policy. And, and economic measures. And if we now look at what is happening to the well-being of people because of the economic situation, uh, it's especially the well-being of the vulnerable uh, that is uh, uh, under stress uh, because the energy prices are skyrocketing. Uh, a lot of uh, people who live in poor housing uh, see skyrocketing energy bills, cannot afford it anymore. They pay a large share of their income on uh, energy consumption uh, with the price hikes that are, we're seeing again. Uh, of people of low income people uh, pay a higher percentage of their income on uh, consumption goods and and so they're going to get hit more so i think this makes it all the more urgent to uh, develop a social democratic agenda where we make sure that there is a basic uh, level of well-being available for everybody um, so whereas in the past the focus was very much on how can we make the pie bigger, uh, you know, in light of the environmental concerns, it's more on how can we divide this pie in a more equal manner. And one thing that is really uh, uh, strange and needs to be addressed in the Netherlands is the uh, wealth inequality. Income inequality is quite, uh, you know, at par with other countries, but we have tremendous wealth inequality in the Netherlands and very low taxes, um, you know, when people pass and pass it or die and pass it on to their children. I, I don't know what you call that tax, but that really needs to, uh, you know, needs to be addressed. So there's there are great opportunities uh, that I see in light of the present economic situation to divide the pie more equally. Um, also, um, uh, company taxes are 
ridiculously low. Uh, taxes on labor are really high. Taxes on wealth are really low. Um, so there, there, there's a there's a need to uh, reform the tax system and need to reform the labor market. In the labor market, there are lots of inequalities between people with uh, uh, you know, regular employment contracts and platform workers, uh, etc. Um, so I think the the the, you know, the economic crisis that uh, is on its way uh, gives extra impetus and extra momentum to forward uh, a social democratic response to it. You mentioned a lot there about uh, dependency on uh, energy, um, and obviously uh, there's a big debate that's happening in Australia as we speak as well. I think Australians on the left feel that our we've had a we have had a conservative government for uh, over a decade, but that changed uh, on the twenty first of May, and we now have a new Labor government. And for the first time, we have a government that's now seriously talking about more invest, investment in renewable energy. Um, we're we're heavily reliant on um, getting our energy through um, gas or, or coal in Australia. We always look to the Europeans and think that you guys are doing it very very well. Um, but even still, I guess the uh, the war in Ukraine has sort of exposed a lot of the uh, European market that is reliant on Russian gas or Russian oil. And I just want to get a sense of um, has that meant that the 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 nations in 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 the EU have started to realise that we need to probably move a bit quicker in terms of moving towards greater uh, renewable energy sources and also your own producing your own domestic energy source. What, talk to me about what's going on in the Netherlands in the Netherlands in terms of that conversation right now. Yeah, that conversation is certainly uh, uh, gathering uh, momentum, uh, uh, and I think it's helping put, push forward the Fit for 55 package of Frans Timmermans and the European Green Deal uh, is getting extra support uh, because the present situation makes it all the more clear how urgent the situation is. For the long time in the Netherlands, we relied on a, a, a big gas uh, a field um, in the northern part, uh, but uh, extracting the gas uh, led to a lot of damage uh, of, sit of of houses and stress among the uh, people in Um Yes, exactly. Um, so uh, at present, uh, we're uh, increasing our coal uh, production or in the coal industry. Uh, because of the uh, Russian situation, uh, mm. but everybody feels that this is very, very undesirable. Uh, and uh, you know, with extra speed, uh, we have to uh, green our economy and uh, support the proposals that Frank Timmer uh, Frans Timmermans put forward. Um, last question: uh, You had your party conference just recently, and uh, there was an interesting vote about entering into a, a formal relationship with the Greens party. Can you tell us a bit about that and what the, why that came about, and what does this mean for the parties going forward? Yes, so the vote was on the next Senate elections. Um, and uh, the vote at the Congress was to have a shared, uh, or what do you call it, fraction or shared uh, party in the Senate, you know, the Greens and yep. uh, the Labour Party combined. Um, and uh, there are people very enthusiastic about this in this party. They feel that in, 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 the, in the, the, the Labour Party, they feel that you know, the, the future needs to be green and we need to join red and green. We need to make, need to make sure that green is available and affordable for everybody. Um, those are the enthusiasts, the critics worry that we're losing our uh, social democratic roots. Uh, they're worried that uh, the voters we've lost are, are not going to come back if we join forces with the Green Party because the Green Party is less concerned about making it affordable for everybody and may make some decisions that are hurting people that are struggling just to, uh, to uh, you know, make ends meet. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating situation in which uh, we're in at present as a Labour Party, uh, trying to take the advantage, uh, trying to, 
know, take, uh, uh, make sure that there are more advantages of what we're doing than disadvantages. Because the advantage, of course, if you join forces, especially since we have such a fractured landscape, political landscape in the Netherlands, uh, is that you, 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 know, you, you become an important uh, powerhouse or you know, the, the, the power uh, question uh, starts playing a role. Uh, a, a potential danger is that uh, you know, the real left-wing people are going to go to the socialist party and the real green people are going to go to the party for the animals, which is a party we have in parliament as well. So that's a balancing act that uh, I'm, I'm working on as a, a president of the Labour Party to uh, you know, make sure that this is a winning proposition and a proposition in which, as far as I'm concerned, social democracy is non-negotiable. Um, and that's uh, what I stand for and what I will fight for in this collaboration. Well, I don't, I can't imagine that would have been easy negotiations to have with the Greens party in the first place, but to pull that off at your own party conference would have been a, a huge achievement. And we'll be watching uh, the, your next round of elections with very uh, close interest to see how, how that uh, marriage or that relationship goes. Uh, Esther, Miriam, Sen, thank you so much for your time today and coming on the podcast to have a chat to us. And we want to wish you and the party the best of luck with your upcoming elections. Uh, and we look forward to talking to you sometime in the future. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And to get all the latest on Socially Democratic, follow Dunstreet on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday. <laughs>